Welcome, everybody. Um, glad you could join us today. We are going to be talking about Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, uh, a brand new release from uh, Red Hat uh, that was introduced in May of 2022. Um, with me today, my name is uh, Rob Locke. I'm a senior solutions architect with the Red Hat North American Training and Certification Team. Uh, I've been with the training and certification team for a lot of years. Uh, first earned my Red Hat Certified Engineer way back in 2003 uh, and been working with uh, the training and certification team since. Uh, writing curriculum, creating the exams that you all love, uh, and uh, going through and, and working now uh, to help folks figure out what courses and such will help them in their technology journey. Uh, joining me today is Wes Urquhart. Uh, he is also a solution architect here with the training and certification team. Uh, so as you are looking for help with our sales folks uh, as to where you need to go on your journey, uh, you may get help from either Wes or I. Wes, during the presentation, will be uh, happily answering questions that you may put into the chat window um, and uh, will obviously pop in at the end uh, as we go through a, a more official Q&A sort of time. So thanks, Wes, for being here. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, what's this all about? Well, remember that Red Hat Enterprise Linux is looking to provide you with the flexibility, the stability, the reliability, because it's all about hybrid cloud innovation now, right? So that's what we're going to be focusing on here with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. So how we're going to do this is we're going to start off by talking about the pillars of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And I'll talk a little bit about what those are. Uh, we'll then go through some program updates that have happened now with uh, RHEL. Uh, and we'll also take a look at some of the technical features in our new version. And of course, we'll give you some ideas as to how you can see this new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux for yourself, some of the uh, options that are available to you, and some of the things we have specifically in the training and certification arena. Now, as we start talking about the pillars of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, of course, we always focus on the value of the Red Hat subscription. Remember, for us as an organization, it's a subscription model. We're not selling the software what we are doing is we are selling the support and the services around that software. And so it's the support and expertise that we provide. It's the security resources. It's the, the wonderful partner ecosystem that we have, um, that we have a long life cycle support and some flexibility to that life cycle, uh, that we actually project and give you product roadmaps and most recently, we've been adding a bunch of proactive analytics to the environment that I think you might find a little interesting. So as a backdrop to that value of the Red Hat learning, uh, the Red Hat subscription is these pillars. And so the first pillar is called innovate. Uh, right, it's all about accelerating our innovation, that move to the hybrid cloud being able to have the latest tool chains, uh, whether it be the, the latest uh, GCC, Rust, Go compilers, whatever you happen to be working with, making sure that we are supporting you as you're making that move into the hybrid cloud. Our second uh, pillar is the idea of optimize. As you're rolling out to the hybrid cloud, our infrastructures are becoming a bit more complex. So how do I increase the efficiency and streamline that management so that we can do it at scale? We need something that's consistent and repeatable, right? We need those deployments out there as we go to scale out our applications that they're all running exactly the same whether it's on-premise, whether it's virtualized workloads, whether it's in the cloud, or nowadays out at the edge of our computing environments. Our third pillar 
is one of protect. So how do I establish a consistent and secure foundation? As we're all moving to that hybrid cloud, we have to be a little bit more concerned about our security posture. And so as we scale those apps, as we roll out what are truly emerging technologies, how do I make sure that we are uh, secure and stable and trustworthy as we operate with our customers? And then our final pillar is one of trust. Now, this is something that we at Red Hat work every single day to make sure that you can operate with complete confidence in the facilities and technologies that we supply to you. You need to have a reliable cloud-ready platform that's got the long life cycle that you need for your enterprise, that it's tied in with the partners, that it has tools for managing the devices, managing the security profiles, and so on within that hybrid cloud. And so these four pillars, innovate, optimize, protect, and trust, are how we are framing the conversation about our subscriptions. Well, let's get into Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, all right? What are the program updates? What sort of changes have we made? Well, as most of you are aware, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9.0 was announced for general availability on May 18th of 2022. Interestingly, this was one week after we introduced 8.6. Uh, and so, you know, what about that? 8.6 introduced on May 11th. What you're going to find is a lot of the features that I'm talking about here being introduced in 9.0 are also available in 8.6, but there are some caveats to that, right? I mean, 8.6 is three years into the life cycle of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. We're just beginning the life cycle of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. So what does that life cycle look like? Again, this is the same life cycle that we have for eight. We're just already three years into it. What you'll notice here is that in the life cycle, the basic 10 year life cycle that we've committed to you, is that in the first five years, we provide what we term full support. And then for the remaining five years, we go into a maintenance support phase. Now, we do offer as an add-on for those organizations that need an extra couple of years to make a migration. We do have an extended life phase, um, but very little uh, feature changes and, and security updates and that sort of stuff are happening in the extended life phase. We're doing this really a, on an ad hoc basis for those customers that need it. But let's talk about some of the differences between full support and maintenance support. During the full support phase, you are going to receive all of the critical and important Red Hat security advisories. Now, you might see some urgent and other selected ones, but you're getting all of the critical important ones during the full support phase. High priority Red Hat bug fix advisories and even possibly some enhancement advisories will be brought in during the full support phase. Now, during that full support phase, and uh, we will release minor releases of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. And with each of those minor releases, we are going to not only provide the cumulative security bug fix and enhancement advisories, we also may add some additional software functionality. We're also focused on hardware enablement. 
So if some new processor comes out two years from now, and we want to be able to support that in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, that hardware enablement can happen with the minor release as long as we're in the full support phase. At the end of those five years, when we transition into the maintenance support phase, there's no more hardware enablement being done. There's no enhanced software functionality being planned. Maintenance support is just that, maintenance. We'll continue to provide security advisories. We will continue to supply urgent bug fix advisories during that maintenance support phase. But in essence, the maintenance support phase reflects the final minor release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 spanned over those five years. So let's try to put some dates to this. What are we talking about here with minor releases? Well, our goal is to have a new minor release about every six months. And so with 9.0 coming out in May of 2022, you can see there 9.1 being introduced towards the end of 2022. And likely 9.2 coming out probably May-ish of 2023 and so on down the line. And as you see us progress, we get to that five years in May of 2027 and we're releasing the final minor release, 9.10. So this allows you to have a little bit of a schedule to understand when changes are happening. What's also interesting with this is that we have found that most organizations do not necessarily want to be doing a roll-up with any kind of enhanced functionality, or new hardware support or that sort of stuff every six months. Once a year seems to be a little bit happier place. And so what you'll find with this is you'll see that each even minor release has an extended band off to the right, referring to something called extended update support. So in effect, you can lock yourself, for example, at 9.2 and be able to get the necessary support for that two years. And then you could jump to 9.4 for another year, jump to not, or jump straight to 9.6, all right, and operate with that for two years. So we're creating an extended support function within the major release. And while we've had this for a while, we're now, uh, I'll say, codifying it a little bit more for you so that you can have a, a, a more predictable sort of cadence to what's going on with this. Now, I mentioned 8.6 at the beginning of this. Well, 8.6 came out three years ago. And so, if we look at 8.6, we look, we see we're only getting four more minor releases before we go into maintenance mode. We've only got two years left of full support on RHEL 8. And so to have the longest possible support structure, you may want to consider starting that migration to 9. Now, other program updates. I'm really hoping that you're already familiar with this thing known as the Red Hat Developer Subscription. This is allowing individual developers, perhaps like you, to be able to directly develop your application on actual Red Hat Enterprise Linux for no charge. That's the goal here. We want to allow you to be working with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We don't want you to have to go off to some alternate distribution, to some other environment that's sort of like Red Hat Enterprise Linux and necessarily have to do your development over there. And then as you port it for production, 
onto Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you start running into some challenges, perhaps. So with the developer program, this is allowing you to be able to run actual RHEL and do your development. Now, we have had this for a little while now, but we've tweaked some things here. Um, what this does provide for an individual, not a corporation, but for an individual, you can have a single subscription and you can run up to 16 physical or virtual nodes that are then subscribed to our content distribution network and be able to get the updates. You can be going to, you know, 9.2 or 9.4 or whichever version uh, you want to be playing with. The key, though, is this is for individuals. This is uh, free. And so it is deemed a self-supported environment. Um, but it allows you to do any kind of development, test, even small-time production, you know, as an individual. You can even, if you prefer, you don't have the hardware sitting in your basement to do this, you can go ahead and deploy this into the major public clouds and have this tied in to the same subscription. This is all available self-service through the developer program. And I'll have some URLs and things for this a little bit later on. But what's truly new that we introduced in 2022 is the idea of a Red Hat developer subscription for teams. You know, the individual was very successful. It helps uh, uh, single individuals to operate. But what about a, a, a corporate development team that wants to be able to build out development environments and, again, don't necessarily want to be spending production dollars on that development environment. And so this gives the entire team access to Red Hat Enterprise Linux for development work only. So no little onesie twosie productions, all right? Development work only at effectively no charge. A single organizational subscription, you can get up to 25,000 physical or virtual developer nodes with this. Again, You'll get the security updates, the patches, and so on. You can deploy this out to the cloud uh, and be able to access it there. You know, however you want to implement it for your development team and so that we can be operating together and managing those development systems as a group. And so this is the new piece that we've just introduced this year. And we're hoping we'll make it better for those organizations in deploying their development work also on RHEL. All right, so those are some program updates. Now, what is new in the platform itself? What are some new features and things? Well, um, as with every new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we uh, shift to a new kernel. And so with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, that means kernel 5.14. The kernel, of course, is that heart of the operating system. So again, we're running that newer version. A couple of the features specific to 5.14, uh, we now have a lightweight wire guard service enabled. This can give you VPN capabilities with a little bit faster response rates. Um, it's now a kernel element. Traditionally, VPN um, activities have been done in user space. And so there was a lot of overhead to that. So this is allowing us to build it directly into the kernel. We've also modified our core scheduling algorithms. Uh, this should improve some of the multi-threading uh, across the CPU cores, um, also designed to help mitigate against a couple of the vulnerabilities that came up over the last couple of years, like Spectre and Meltdown. Now, I say kernel 5.14, but I'm hoping uh, most of you are aware that when we say 5.14 at Red Hat, that means we start with 5.14, but 
But as we progress, some of that enhanced software functionality in the minor releases during the full support phase, you may see us find a feature that maybe is in 515 or 516 or so on that our organizations, our customers really need. You may find us backporting that feature into this 5.14 kernel. So this is not a generic 5.14 kernel. Uh, it starts from that, but it has been enhanced by Red Hat. Speaking of kernel and support for processors, um, being able to deliver out to ARM processors is becoming much more talked about, right? I mean, this is what we're hearing. Even the cloud providers are starting to create ARM solutions uh, and allowing us to deploy on ARM-based equipment within the cloud. And so we now have that same OS available. And so what we put on the slide here is to help identify what are the different CPU architectures that we support. And so uh, traditional AMD and Intel 64-bit architectures, so the x86-64 uh, still there. We've added the ARM architecture, specifically the spec ARM 8.0A. This, by the way, does not include Raspberry Pi. Just want to say that right off the bat. Um, we also have some of the IBM systems that people are using, IBM Power Systems and IBM Z, uh, specific releases of that being available. So now we can provide Red Hat Enterprise Linux across another architecture for you. This makes it much more interesting in terms of our support for the edge, right? I mean, we may find that we've got ARM processors out at that edge. But when you go to manage the edge, there are things that you need to be able to do differently. You know, it's, it's one thing when it was all in the data center, you know, and, and we could send someone into that data center and they could go, you know, take the hammer and, and, and beat up the things. With the edge, the equipment is everywhere. And so we need additional tools to help us to manage that. So things like zero touch provisioning, um, having more visibility into the health of those edge systems. And again, as it, we worry about security that protect, um, being able to remediate uh, security concerns out there. And so you'll see a lot of edge discussion with our open hybrid cloud and in particular OpenShift as we look to work with containers out at those edges. And so being able to automate the container updates and rollback, all a piece there. Even doing major release upgrade support remotely, transparently stage those OS upgrades in the background. Um, we'll talk some more about Image Builder a little bit later on, uh, where we can simplify the installation process, again, across all of the different places that you're deploying to. Now, RHEL for workstations is another program or technical adjustment here. Now, when I say RHEL for workstation, this is not some new form of RHEL desktop. What we are talking about here are high-end workstation workloads. So we're talking about things that are, you know, high-performance graphics, animation, scientific activities, you know, those types of workloads uh, in our environment. Uh, so as part of that RHEL for workstation, we've been optimizing and adding support for the hardware that would be used in those environments. And so RHEL for Workstation giving us the ability to roll that out to those systems and run those application workloads. Same 10-year life cycle, same certified hardware, same enterprise support, same extensive partner ecosystem. 
all a part of the workstation program. As part of that, we've updated GNOME as the desktop environment to run on those workstations. And so GNOME 40 uh, is now the new version. This does mean we are using Wayland by default and moving away from the insecure X11 protocol uh, and some of the uh, concerns that that brought forth. Another thing we've introduced are this, uh, or GNOME has introduced is this idea of a classification banner. Uh, this allows you to display, for example, regulatory information on the user's screen at times that you designate. Uh, and so these banners can be forced open and help you with some of your compliance issues. All right, so those are program updates. Now let's go a little deeper into some of the technical features that are coming with RHEL 9. And we'll talk about these in the context of the pillars. So the first technical feature features we wanna look at is what's helping us to accelerate innovation. Well, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, it's about keeping your development tools fresh. So obviously with the initial release of RHEL 9, we have updated the development tools to the new versions, uh, the current versions that many of us would be looking for today. But one of the things we've done is we've redefined application streams that we introduced originally in RHEL 8 and the use of things like Code Ready Linux Builder. We can provide software, all right, these compilers, these development tools in the form of RPMs or even potentially as flat packs, again, for the workstation model. We still have modules but we're changing the scope of those and we're changing the scope of AppStreams itself. So you may recall in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, we divvied up the distribution into a, a base OS tree and an AppStreams tree. Now the stuff that's in the base OS tree, that's the stuff we've got for 10 years. It's gonna be there, it's gonna be updated, it's going to be uh, security and bug fixed, you know, along. App streams represents things like development tools where, let's be honest, the particular version we have of some development tool is great today, but two years from now, I may want a newer version of that. But I also may want to be able to work with both versions. And so modules is what gives me an ability to be able to install multiple versions perhaps of this, but also to extend and have different life cycles for those development tools based upon what you, our customers, are looking for. Uh, one thing I can say with confidence though is in RHEL 9, we have finally punted Python 2. All right. And so the migration to Python 3 has been completed, though, admittedly, the Python version that we standardized on for RHEL 9 is 3.9. I know everybody keeps asking me, where's 3.10? So um, perhaps another module coming soon in app streams with a future minor release of RHEL 9 may begin to give us a later version of Python to be able to play with. The other thing I'd like to at least make some point of is the fact that RHEL 9 is the first version of RHEL that is built and based entirely on CentOS streams. I know there was a lot of churn and concern when we um, introduced CentOS streams, but the goal here is to provide a platform that we can operate closer with our partner ecosystem. I mean, how does a hardware vendor know what's coming in the next release of RHEL? How can they be testing their software with that next release of RHEL? 
they use CentOS streams. And so CentOS streams has become that ideal environment for us to work better with our partners and frankly, even with you, our customers, to perhaps see where RHEL's going in the near future. I've been talking a lot about developers, right? Because it really is about building those applications for that open hybrid cloud. Uh, RHEL provides us with the platform to make that happen, but we have redesigned the developer portal, uh, developers.redhat.com. This is where you would subscribe and, and register for that individual developer subscription if you haven't done so already. You can download RHEL, join the developer program, but part of that redesign that has come out in 2022 is that we have built a lot more content into that site. So it's giving you the ability to learn about RHEL, but lots of blogs and articles and how-tos, all of that content available through the developer's portal. So free, getting all of this knowledge, all of this software to be able to deploy and build your applications. I mentioned containers a little while ago. And of course, with RHEL 9, we have updated Podman to 4.0. Uh, so we have the latest version of Podman available to us. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, it means that we've got improved IPv6 support. In fact, dual stack support. Well, I have to caveat this a little bit. So dual stack support is now the default for the upstream Podma, Podman package or, or a project. We actually enable dual stack support on a previous version of Podman, but that was a Red Hat customization. Those changes have been accepted by upstream, and that dual stack support is now the default for all Podman 4.0 implementations. We've also been learning about the universal base images that we provide to you and changes that we want to be able to make uh, to those uh, based on your feedback. So RHEL 9 now comes available in UBI images ranging from as small as seven and a half meg for a container image up to about 80 meg for that container image, depending upon how much stuff you want. All right. The seven and a half, a really small init based image and the 80 meg, the full standard UBI image. Again, for you to be able to implement your apps. The containers are now being secured by default using C group two. Um, one of the things that existed previously with C group V1, if you will, is that while there were some standards defined for a couple of the resource definitions, the process definitions, um, other areas that were missing uh, were extended. It, it was extendable, but there weren't a lot of standards around those. And so it was a, a bit of a free-for-all. And so you would have different partners implementing different standards of their own. C Group 2 is now uh, defining a broader standard for us to use. And uh, this is now improving our resource utilization and making process definitions more consistent for us to manage. So that was about innovate. Let's talk about optimize. How do I ensure that consistent delivery? Well, hopefully you've been exploring in RHEL 8, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Image Builder. One of the challenges though, with Image Builder is that you needed to go 
and build an infrastructure within your organization to build those images. So the beauty now and what we're introducing is a new image builder service. So you can go to the web and be able to define what you want in that image and build that image using those online services. And you can integrate that online service into your own CICD deployment workflows. So the new image builder service, making it a little bit easier perhaps for you to create those gold images. So what does image builder provide? Well, here we're looking at image builder, uh, honestly on rel eight, uh, but it's defining a rel eight release that we want. We identify the target environment that we want this image to, to be deployed on. It could be one of the public clouds or as is checked here at the moment, a virtualization guest image, something that we could deploy within our own private infrastructure. Um, it also can support bare metal deployments now. And so it could create uh, a custom installation media with the kickstart file, et cetera, to automate the process of deploying onto that bare metal. We also now have um, the ability for you to customize the file systems used in here. So no longer are you required to have a single large root file system. I mean, you can if you want, but you're not required now to have just a single large root file system. You can actually have multiple distinct file system mount points. So the steps that you go through, first, choose the platform. What am I trying to build for? Uh, am I deploying this out to physical, to the private cloud, to the public cloud, or maybe to an edge device, bare metal maybe? We select which tool we want to use. Do we want to use the service at console.redhat.com, or did we build out our own infrastructure to do a private build on premise? We create what's called a blueprint, which defines all the elements that we want in that image. We then click build, where it's going to target to, and then we deploy that instance. So consistently built images, optimizing your workflow strategies. What about the pillar of protect? Well, by default, RHEL 9 is more secure than previous versions. Um, not only have we enhanced logging and improved performance of security elements like SE Linux, but we have also integrated newer specifications uh, for encryption and such. One thing I'll be honest caught me by surprise, uh, root login for SSH using a password was disabled by default. Uh, and so when I was first playing with RHEL 9, uh, I had deployed a system, tried to SSH into it, provided the password that I had defined for this new deployment and it didn't let me in. Um, it does support keys, so you can use keys to get connected to that uh, latest um, RHEL 9 system uh, without making any changes, but password uh, is now disabled by default. It's a new option uh, in the SSHD config file for you. We're also disabling some of the older encryption algorithms that have you know, gotten a little too long in the tooth uh, that uh, have been exposed uh, in some ways. Already mentioned C group two, providing us uh, a better and more consistent security profile uh, for the uh, containers running on our system. Um, there are lots of security compliance organizations that are defining various standards out there. And so we've taken RHEL 9, 
through and support many of those standards. Uh, and so here's uh, definitions of some additional ones that we have pulled in. Our final pillar is one of trust. How do I trust that what I'm deploying out there is secure and operable, um, consistent uh, within my environment? Well, you may have seen a little bit of use of this in RHEL 8, but we introduced this idea of a RHEL system role. The concept of a system role is to provide us with Ansible roles that will uh, define and configure a system for the role that it's taking. You know, is this system going to be a firewall? Is it going to be a member of an H, you know, high availability cluster? Um, is it going to be a web server? Um, is it just a, a Linux box that I want to be able to manage using the web console? All right. And so there are all of these different system roles that are included with RHEL to, again, streamline and make it easier for you to ensure that they're all running the same way. Trust your environment. We've made some changes to the high availability components. Uh, that are uh, made available with RHEL. Uh, as part of that, we've added some more fencing agents and done more integration with Ansible and the cluster-based system roles. I don't know if you've played with this yet in RHEL, not, RHEL 8, but we've had a web console now. Um, you've perhaps seen it as you log in. It says to enable the console enable this cockpit socket. Um, the goal of the web console is to allow you and I from a, a single point, be able to more easily remotely monitor and assess the systems and the infrastructure we've put out there. And so uh, here's an example um, stats screen uh, that we have uh, through the web console. You can see how many CPUs we have, what the load is on them, what uh, services are using the most CPU, what services are using the most RAM, um, what's my disk utilization, what's my network performance. So, you know, the four core things that we look at systems for their performance. Um, we've got uh, lots of new performance metrics that are included as part of the web console. But one feature that's introduced in RHEL 9 uh, that's available that we can do through this web console is the idea of a kernel live patch. Uh, this is where we can update, perhaps apply a security patch to a live running kernel without having to reboot. Uh, and so we can maintain that security uh, through that environment. The other thing that uh, some of you may have noticed is that we are uh, deprecating uh, the use of a graphical virtual virtualization tool called Vert Manager. Um, this was a tool that allowed you to sort of manage the VMs on a particular system, uh, but using it remotely was always a bit challenging. And so uh, we're effectively deprecating Vert Manager in favor of using the web console to manage the virtual machines that are running on that particular host. And so you enable the web console on the hypervisor host, and you can go ahead and manage the VMs through that. You can even uh, uh, associate particular host devices directly to a VM, do the pass-through stuff like many of us would do with Vert Manager uh, when we were running the stuff locally. So. Web console, absolutely something that uh, we're investing quite a bit in. Did you know the web console works on a mobile device? So you can use a mobile web browser, point to that system, uh, to the cockpit service that's running there, and be able to view and troubleshoot all of those same things that you could have been doing uh, from a full screen web browser uh, sitting on a laptop or desktop. 
So this might make it a little bit easier for you to do some of your after hours or some of your on-call situations is using the mobile form of the web console. Um, Performance Copilot is the toolkit that we are using now for in-depth analysis of the performance of a system. And so we've enhanced and integrated these statistics into the web console, but more importantly, we've improved the scalability of PCP itself. Um, you know, one of the challenges is every time you put in a monitoring piece is how does the monitoring itself affect the performance of the system? And so uh, we've improved the scalability of PCP here to uh, make things uh, more efficient. Now, how many of you are using Red Hat Insights? And again, this ties into the trust thing. How can I be sure that the systems I have out there deployed are all secure, that they're compliant, that they have the updates we're expecting them to have, that they're healthy, that they're not running out of CPU um, usage. So Red Hat Insights is a service that we have that with your systems tied in to their subscription, you can use insights to be monitoring those systems, but the beauty of insights is its proactive um, approach. It will assess the systems as they check in. It will provide you with reports and assessments so that you know which systems are not uploading their reports out of compliance. We can know which uh, sets of patches have or haven't been applied. We even have a vulnerability service uh, that can go out and when a new vulnerability is uh, released, it can go out and assess which of your systems are still vulnerable uh, to that new vulnerability. So these are all things that are part of the uh, service known as Red Hat Insights. What about Red Hat Satellite? Well, as typically happens when we release a new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, we need to make some adjustments to satellite as a management infrastructure. And so we've added the support for RHEL 9 host to satellite 611, uh, and the GA for that was announced July 5th. Um, nothing that you have to specifically do uh, if you're running satellite 611, uh, you just have to register your RHEL 9 systems to that satellite infrastructure. All right, so finally here, how do I go about seeing for myself um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9? Well, we've already talked about the idea of you registering for your individual developer subscription at developers.redhat.com, and there's a lot of content there, but that's a way you could create your own VM, create your own cloud instance, and be able to work with RHEL. But what about learning about RHEL in general? You know, there are some changes and things that happen with each major release. You know, things that we tell you about way back on RHEL 7, you know, that we all ignored, and we told you, well, eventually this is gonna go away, and you don't bother to pay attention back then. And then we get to the rel eight and we go, you know, this really is going to go away. And then all of a sudden in rel nine, it's gone. Like Python two, it's gone. All right. Well, we of course update our classes uh, in the Red Hat training and certification portfolio to operate in rel nine and focus on the best practices of implementing that version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And so, you know, as we made the migration from init to system D, we started teaching you about how to use that uh, boot up process. As we're making the change from traditional if CFG system five init script files for managing your network devices, over to network manager, well, we gradually start showing you that transition. So what have we updated? Well, already uh, RH-124, 
RH-134, and the corresponding exam, RHCSA exam, Red Hat Certified System Administrator exam, have all been updated to RHEL 9 as of late May 2022. Additionally, RH-199, which is the combination of 124 and 134 for very experienced Linux folks, um, that has also been updated to RHEL 9. In essence, RH-124 is about a week's content. RH-134, also a week's content. RH-199 condenses those two weeks down to a single week. And I like to point to that one as a great way to refresh yourself on what has changed with RHEL 9 and perhaps some newer, better practices. I will tell you at the time that uh, I'm presenting this to you uh, and we're recording this, that RH-294, which is for the Red Hat Certified Engineer Program, that one is still in development. We expect to be releasing that in fall of 2022. So what do these courses ultimately provide you? And so what I want to do is take a moment to talk to you about an example of one of these classes in our Red Hat Learning subscription. Now, the Red Hat Learning subscription provides you with the content from our courses in a self-paced scenario and ability to go through and uh, learn the content at a time that's convenient for you. Alternatively, of course, we are still offering these courses in an in-person uh, type scenario, whether that be a virtual training five-day class or whether it be uh, an in-person uh, class at a facility. Uh, it's also still available in that modality. But let's go ahead here and take a look at the Red Hat Learning subscription for a moment. So let me hop over to this screen. And what I've done is I've gone to roll.redhat.com and uh, roll.redhat.com is um, uh, our learning subscription portal. And I've already searched for and found Red Hat System Administration 1. And so uh, from here, when I first go into the course, I've got a table of contents where I can see the various chapters that are being presented, uh, talking about things like uh, how to manage files from the command line, how to edit text files, and you get to learn about the glory that is Vim, um, managing users in groups uh, locally on the system, and then extending that to control access to the files on the file system. We go into processes and services. We configure and secure SSH, look at log files. But what I want to take a look at is here in Chapter 12. Now, I started alluding to if CFG files. Yeah, they're effectively gone in RHEL 9. Uh, admittedly, if you have an upgrade, of a RHEL 8 system to RHEL 9, uh, RHEL 9 will process existing IFCFG files, but if you're looking to create new network connections, new network devices, you really need to be using the new methodologies through Network Manager and this concept of system connections. And so Chapter 12 talks about the basic networking concepts. It talks about uh, how to verify your networking configuration and how to configure networking from the command line. But the section I want to take a look at here is section 12.7, editing a network configuration file. And so this goes through and starts talking about these new key files, um, key file format. And so from the previous section that was teaching you NMCLI, connection modify commands and arguments that you could pass to that. In here, we're identifying that in these NM connection files, which are the new uh, source files for configuring your network devices, what that looks like. 
And it's sort of an any style uh, file with a bunch of uh, key equals value pairs uh, broken out into sections. And so this goes through and identifies a lot of the elements, how you go about modifying that network configuration, the different places that this information is stored uh, to sort of give you an idea as to where you might want to be making your changes. You know, you probably should not be editing the files under user lib, you know, by hand. That's the pre-deployed immutable profiles. Instead, you should probably be doing it under Etsy. But then we do have slash run, you know, where you have the live sort of settings of the environment. So this goes through and tells you some steps to go through to make that happen. Right? Now, what we also have here, besides the table of contents and the course elements itself, I can go to the lab environment. And with all my VMs up and running, I can open a console, which will open up another tab and bring me in. Now, I've already logged into this console. It's my workstation VM. And it's where I tend to perform the steps of an exercise. So I've got the two tabs here. If I go back to the tab and go back to the course, if I click Next, that'll bring me to the guided exercise. And what you'll find in the guided exercise is that there are a series of commands that you need to do. So for example, to start the exercise, and this is true of, of many of these, uh, did I specify the right name there? Yeah, net edit. Most of our exercises will start with a, a lab start command. And what this is doing is just verifying that all of the systems are in a state that we expect so that you can have success with that exercise. And so it checks those lab systems as, it's, as, as it says, we had success. It backs up the network config because evidently we're gonna be messing with that. Uh, and so sort of shows us uh, that that's been successfully done. So after I run the lab start net edit, the next thing it tells me to do in the exercise is to SSH into server A, because what I'm going to want to do is to make some adjustments to the settings there. And so let me go ahead and SSH, as it says, student at server A. Here I am now, my prompt is that. And from here, what it wants me to do is to take a look at what are my current network settings. And so a couple of commands here, we have IP link, an MCLI connection show, and doing an LS of the network manager tree. So let's try each of those. I'll do an IP link. And I see that I have one ethernet interface here called ETH0. If I do, What's the next command? Oh, the NMCLI. So NMCLI con show. And here we see that I've got a connection called wired connection one. It's got a big long UUID to help uniquely identify it. It is an ethernet connection and here's the device name that it's uh, tied to. If I do an LS under Etsy, network manager system connections oops um lowercase s there i see the file wired connection one nm connection so let me go ahead and if i want to make changes to that i need to escalate my privileges to become root to be able to make a change. And so let me go ahead and sudo dash I. So now I'm root and I can go in and modify that file. And as I look at this file, we see some general information about it up top. We then see some IPv4 addressing information, some IPv6 addressing information. And so what they specifically wanted me to do in the instructions is we're going to add a second address. I think it's slash 24. So let me double check that I've got the right IP address there. Look back at my instructions. Uh, oh, it's 10011 they want me to use. Okay, so let me go ahead and 
adjust that. Then 011 slash 24. So I've put the IP address in there. Now, if I do a check of my IP address, I don't have that IP address yet. After you make a change to the file, you've got to do some more. So they say we need to do an NMCLI con reload and a NMCLI con up. So let me go ahead and do that. On reload. Now, if I take a look at the interface, I see that it's got both IP addresses here. So I've gone through and done that. Now the exercise itself goes steps further. It actually has me going into server B, making a corresponding IP address over there and confirming actual communication can happen over that new network address that we've put in there. All right. So that gives you a little bit of an idea as to some of the things we can do in the Red Hat Linux or Red Hat Learning subscription uh, with courses like RH124 to give you some exposure to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. So what we've talked about today are the four basic pillars of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We had innovate, optimize, protect, and trust. We learned about some program updates that are happening with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, things around, for example, the developer subscription and now the support for teams uh, with that developer subscription, along with a uh, renewed emphasis on RHEL workstation for those workloads. We saw a bunch of technical features that have changed uh, to, again, make things better for you, whether it be the image builder service, whether it be new certification compliances that are in place, whether it be even changes to how we're doing networking. All right, all of these technical features here in RHEL 9. And now you've got a little bit of a blueprint of how you want to go ahead and progress on and maybe get your hands on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. So what we'll do at this point is pause for some questions and answers. And so let's go ahead and uh, see what else uh, you all might want to know about with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9.